The 15th of January 2023 was a strange day for Germany. It was windy in the north. So windy that the thousands of wind turbines studded across land and sea were spinning at full force. At times there was almost enough wind energy to power the entire country. Well, theoretically, because practically it couldn't get to where it was needed. Eventually, the wind turbines had to be slowed down, meaning cheap and clean electricity got wasted. In the south, meanwhile, people were urged to save energy. Neighboring countries were asked for backup capacity and dirty coal power plants fired up. So while one half of the country was drowning in electricity, the other was taking precautions not to run out of it. What happened here highlights probably the most overlooked challenge of shifting to renewable energy not just in Germany, but everywhere. Building wind parks and solar farms is one thing. Another is to get electricity to where it's needed, when it's needed. So what exactly needs to happen and why? When's the last time you plugged in your phone and it didn't charge? Well, depending on where you live, this might have never happened. And we kind of take it for granted that most of the time electricity is coming out and your device works. This is Kelly Sanders. She's an engineer who researches how energy systems evolve. Um, but what's going on behind the scenes is actually quite complex. The electricity you use is only generated as you use it. And to get to you, it travels through an intricate network of wires, cables and transformers called the grid. The grid is made up of the generators that create the electricity, like gas or nuclear power plants or wind turbines. The transmission lines that carry it to so-called substations, which transform it to a lower voltage, and the distribution lines that finally deliver it to homes and businesses. All this needs to be in perfect balance at all times. The supply or generation must exactly match the demand or load. If there's too much power, there can be a surge that damages infrastructure. If there's too little, there can be a blackout. To make sure this doesn't happen, there's a grid operator. You can think about that as the conductor of all of the power plants and all of the loads, making everything come together very seamlessly. And this has become a lot harder recently, because to stay in the metaphor, some new musicians have joined the orchestra. So solar panels and wind turbines, they kind of have a mind of their own. Um, so we can't quite control them as well as we can these dispatchable generators that we've had in the past. Dispatchable means electricity sources we have available pretty much on demand, like coal or gas power plants. You can kind of turn them up and turn them down um, according to how you want them to operate. Solar and wind are the opposite of this, non-dispatchable. We need the sun to shine and the wind to blow for them to work. And this flakiness has changed the way our grids are managed. I wouldn't say it's so much a problem, but uh, it's a different challenge that we have compared to the, to the years, uh, 20, 30 years back. This is Tim Meyer Jürgens, the COO of one of Germany's four grid operators. In Germany, more than 40% of electricity comes from renewable sources. It's supposed to reach 80% by 2030. So what challenges does a high share of wind and solar throw up? Well, for one, they make you depend on the weather. It's more difficult to uh, exactly forecast what we can expect the next day. We have fortunately gotten a lot better at this, but even the best forecast can't change the weather. The German word Dunkelflaute, dark doldrums, describes times when there's little sun and little wind, a grid operator's nightmare. And even on days with plenty of both, they might not be there exactly when they're needed. Look at this graph charting solar energy supply throughout a typical summer's day in California. During the day, when the sun is up, it covers a good share of total demand, that's the blue line. But towards the evening, as the sun starts setting, it quickly plummets, widening the gap between supply and demand. Somebody has to be waiting in the wings from a generation resource to turn on really, really quickly. 
And so that, unfortunately, here in California, becomes natural gas. So you kind of have these little combustion turbines that are really, really dirty. And then remember that story from Germany, when the North had to throw away electricity while the South was running short? The renewable energies, if you like, uh, uh, look at Germany, for example, are not always there where you have the load. Germany produces most of its wind energy in the North, most of its solar energy in the South. There's currently no way to get large amounts of wind energy down south where there's a lot of demand from industry, or much solar energy up north for that matter. It's a similar story in the US. Most wind energy is generated in the middle of the country, but more than two-thirds of the population live here, within 100 miles of the border. So that's where the demand is. Consequently, wind and solar are causing grid operators a whole lot of headaches. But what if they aren't the problem? But the grids. For the last, you know, hundred years, we have been um, expanding and designing our grid as a centralized exercise. This is Patricia Hidalgo Gonzalez. She researches how to best build more renewables into our energy system. Historically, we've put power stations close to our cities and brought fuels like coal or gas or later uranium to them. The electricity usually didn't have to travel far. Solar and wind, on the other hand, have to be put where they're fuel, so sunshine and wind is most abundant. And utility companies aren't the only ones generating power. Of course we have the infrastructure of this centralized grid and we'll continue having it because it's cost effective to have this uh, type of uh, system. But now we also see that there's a lot of distributed energy resources. People are putting solar panels on their roofs, for example. Traditional consumers are turning into generators of electricity. Things have changed since the old days, but our grids haven't. They don't fit the energy system we're trying to build. And that leaves us with basically two options. One, we forget about all this renewables mumbo-jumbo and just stick with good old-fashioned coal and gas, which would be an interesting choice given we're in the middle of a climate crisis. Or option number two, we make our grids more flexible. And there's a number of ways we can do that. So we have to transport the electricity from where it's produced to where it's needed. Uh, so we have more transport of energy than we had in the past. This means we have to better connect our grids. That's why grid operator Tenet is building Südlink, a 700 km high voltage transmission line connecting Germany's north to its south. When the sun doesn't shine in the south, it could get wind energy from the north. At least that's the idea. Building out those transmission lines, those very, very large transmission lines, is really difficult. So you have property rights issues, you have issues over, you know, people that are concerned about endangered species and environmental impacts. So building those projects take a really long time and they become really, really expensive. Südlink is a case in point. It was originally planned as an overhead line in 2012. But amid huge public backlash against the monster line, politicians in 2015 decided it was to be built underground. We had to start from the scratch again, because a cable route looks different than an overhead line route. So that alone, only this decision was at least three years. It also roughly tripled the cost of the project to 10 billion euros. And it's still facing resistance, especially from farmers and landowners. By the end of 2022, when Südlink was originally supposed to be finished, not a single cable had been laid. It's now scheduled to be finished in 2028. But despite these challenges, building infrastructure to shift renewable energy to where it's needed is a key part of making the grid more flexible. Another is to build storage into it, to supply energy when it's needed. To cover shorter periods, huge battery packs are already popping up more and more. charge the battery when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing and then you discharge it when those solar resources or wind resources wind down. Some grids also store energy with pumped hydro. You use surplus electricity to pump water up a hill and let it run down through a turbine when you need it back. Both these solutions can only shift a few hours worth of energy though. For days or weeks, for example, to cover a Dunkelflaute, we need other solutions, like hydrogen. We can make it from renewable electricity and then burn it in power plants without any CO2 emissions. 
That doesn't mean that we should uh, burn hydrogen all the time because it's not a very efficient way. But for certain situations, we will still need it. And then there's another part of the solution, which up until recently hadn't really been discussed. We could be the opportunity. So you can increase generation to meet demand. You can also lower demand to kind of meet supply somewhere in the middle. We could, for example, hold off on doing our laundry or running the dishwasher when the grid is stressed and instead do it when there's plenty of renewable energy available. Some utilities already offer their customers lower rates for doing exactly this. And we could let grid operators tap into the electricity from the solar panels on our roofs or the batteries of our electric cars. But now with distributed energy resources, we're thinking about a two-directional flow where now not only from generators to consumers, but now from consumers, which now we would be calling them prosumers because they would be producing electricity, and then supplying it back upstream to a transmission network when it would need it the most. The vision is to build a technology-driven smart grid that gives operators a lot more information to flexibly balance supply and demand. If all this sounds incredibly challenging and expensive, well, that's because it is. This industry study calculated that to hit our net zero targets, grids worldwide need $1.1 trillion of investment every year until 2050. And that's excluding new solar panels and wind turbines. Changing the grid is a monumental task, but it's one we need to tackle if we're serious about quitting fossil fuels. Because in the end, uh, our grids are the backbone of the energy transition. So if we are not successful, the energy transition will not be assess successful. And for me, this is a, a race we must win, so there's no alternative. So what about you? Would you hold off doing your laundry until there's enough renewable electricity? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to hit subscribe, because we have a new video for you every Friday.